Hello and welcome back to the architecture weekly number 52. Can't believe it's been a year of articles, books and papers on software architecture and system design in your inboxes every Sunday. Today we're gonna find out what the architects should know about the data science and machine learning. We'll figure it out how relational databases work in a nutshell and discover the continuous architecture manifesto. Let's go! I'm personally kind of afraid of data science and machine learning because I think it requires a lot of math that I'm not really good at. However, you will hardly build a complex system without any machine learning or data pipelines in it. You would better understand the terms and um, underlying principles, at least at a high level. Red Hat wrote a post in their Enable Architect blog with what you as an architect should really know about the data science and machine learning. This list includes courses, learning materials, data manipulation tools, programming languages that are used in the field, data pipelines, types of machine learnings, and many more. So grab the first link in the issue. We do use relational databases every day in our day-to-day -day work, but do we know enough about them? For example, how do indexes work? Or how do DBs store data on disk? What are B trees? What are the transactions and which levels of resolutions we can get? The Architecture Notes resources uh, has the answers to those questions. So they explain in details uh, what are indexes, what are the search complexity with them and without them, what are the B trees, why they are efficient in storing data and many more. Of course, for the viewers of my YouTube architecture reading series, those terms would not be unfamiliar. And for everyone else, please follow the post in the architecture notes. And the last of highlights today is the Continuous Architecture Manifesto. As we mentioned previously, architecture activity evolved from big upfront design to no design at all. And both approaches are equally bad. Also, the spectre has a long range. We can find ourselves in another point of it, where we do the architecture continuously through the life cycle of our software. It means targeting a long-term product vision, not a short-term project, performing the architecture activities by the whole team, using the holistic approach, and thinking strategically. I'm sharing the link to the Continuous Architecture Manifesto so that you can check it out by yourselves. Okay, time for follow-up section. And I'm starting it with a series of blog posts by Magda New. While reading this classical book on software design, she makes the notes on every chapter that she reads through. And those notes consist of illustrations, explanations, and the most importantly, it has the links to other resources that you might want to check out for further reading. Okay, nice, we started talking about the databases and the next article I'm sharing is the introduction to time series databases. So we face time series data on multiple occasions, from monitoring data to Internet of Things or the financial events like stock prices and so on. In order to store this data efficiently, there are special databases, time series databases, which can work effectively with such kind of data. So what are the advantages of those databases, why they fit well with those types of data, read in the article about the introduction to time series databases. Can't leave you without an article of security and Kubernetes combined. So microservices usually have one well-defined purpose, a narrow API service. It helps improving the security, but does not obviously eliminate the threat completely. One of the tactics to improve the security of microservices in particular is monitoring their behavior. If a malicious user sends irregular requests and our services respond with regular responses times, then we can detect those and we can prevent the attack in the first place or maybe at, uh, at an earlier stage. So follow the blog post in the Kubernetes blog itself. I think it's not a secret that Bolt uses Node.js and TypeScript for all the backend microservices in the company, maybe except for some machine learning and data science payloads. So this is, of course, an architecturally significant decision what technology and what language to use in some part of the system. But this decision actually follows the business motivation of being frugal or doing more with less. So this week, my co-worker, Denis Pesmenny, wrote a piece about this choice, its consequences and drawbacks. Please read how we as a company managed to provide a unified technical framework to develop microservices, support and evolve them properly. Have you ever been to McDonald's? McDonald's is not only a set of restaurants for a quick break. It actually has the big and rich IT infrastructure behind the scenes. 
and the foundation for those systems is an event-driven architecture. So in the next post I'm sharing, Derek Comartin shares some details from the McDonald's post on how do they use schema registries for, for the event-driven architecture, how they validate events, how they try to improve the messaging reliability, and many more. Okay, and the last one for today is the post of Olaf Zimmerman, the author of Patterns of API Design book. So this time he explains that actually the architecture decision record is such a great format that it can be used to capture not only architecture decisions, but any decisions in the organization whatsoever. For example, managerial decisions, organizational decisions, team decisions, etc. He also reasons what actually an architecture significant decision is, how to understand if the decision is architecturally significant, like he provides the heuristic for that, why choosing a programming language is definitely an architecturally significant decision, and many more. So get a fascinating read. Okay, that's it for today. If you want to see your article in this newsletter, drop me an email on the Architecture Weekly Newsletter at gmail.com. And of course, if you like the content here, please leave a like. Please provide a comment down below to tell me what you think about the content. And of course, subscribe to the channel. I know that the majority of my viewers are not subscribed, which is crazy. So please go and fix it. Thank you very much and see ya next week.